Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the live stream for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. Today, Doug and Chad talk sun husbands, a term many of you may not have ever heard, but it has to do with parental alienation, God alienation. It has to do with mothers and their sons forming relationships that look more like marriages than they do uh, uh, mother-son relationships. This also happens with uh, men and women too, or men and daughters too, and uh, I don't want to uh, say that it doesn't or to exclude that. I want everybody to understand that this is something that happens across the aisle, but tonight we're going to focus on son husbands and go from there. So I'm glad you guys are here. I want to say hello to Kimba, Melissa, Louie, Salty Dog, Greetings to all of you. So glad you're here. And we're going to go ahead and say a prayer. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come before your people with these truths from Scripture, from your word, from society, things that are occurring in the church that we need to clean up in order to become without spot or wrinkle and holy without blemish for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just give you all the praise and glory for the opportunity to do so. And I just come against any demonic spirits that would interfere with me or with Chad and the delivering of this message. I also come against any demonic spirits that would interfere with anyone listening. I come against spirits of fear, uh, uh, spirits that would... um, cause this message to be convoluted in their ears and I loose in the mighty name of Jesus I loose that everyone that listens that's experienced this phenomena in their lives would be able to also experience deliverance praise the Lord and come to freedom in the mighty name of Jesus I pray amen amen and amen Chad thank you so much for joining us you know we've been talking about this idea for a while today and I think we're going to have some good information to share with God's people tonight Absolutely. Thanks for having me back on, Doug. So glad you're here. Well, you know, just to get rolling, we've been thinking about uh, this whole God alienation thing, which Chad had sort of defined for us as being when one parent takes their child, alienates the child from the other parent. The other parent spends no time with that child. And lots of times the parent that has been alienated is the one with the relationship with God. And therefore, that child is alienated from being ministered to about the Lord from the parent that knows about the Lord, but also the child is taught to disrespect and to diminish the other parent. And we are going to talk about how, in terms of the mother-son relationship, this sometimes can evolve into a son-husband relationship in which the son takes over many of the positional roles of the former husband or even in sometimes the relationship, the family can still be in a nuclear way and the son is still taking on the role of the father and of the husband when he shouldn't. And things are completely out of sorts. Everything's on its head. God's relationship order that he established in his word is Christ, the head of the man, man, head of the woman, parents, head of the children. That's completely disrupted. The woman takes the man's role and then causes the children to rise up above the man as well. And then God is completely taken out of it and he's supposed to be the head as well. And then he's no longer part of it. And that's probably the biggest error that goes on with this, Chad, is that God is excluded completely, but through a series of exclusions that includes the father's position being taken away. Yeah, we're talking total chaos you know, confusion. I just think of fear, you know, nobody understands their roles any longer, you know, homosexuality thoughts come into play because the the roles are being switched around and reversed in, in different situations. Just a lot of elements are going on and every family has such a different dynamic and situation depending on if it's all girls, all boys, a mixture. Is it the mom alienating or is it the dad alienating? You know, what's going on here? So the dynamics are going to be different per your situation if you're hearing this tonight, but also if you are familiar with a family experiencing something like this where uh, you're an aunt or uncle or grandparent and you're, you're just trying to understand the scope of what's going on, or you, you see the dynamics, but you don't know what to do. So as Doug pray, just be reassured that, you know, we can pray again during this time or afterwards. But, you know, these are these are some tough things to, to hear tonight and to deal with. You know, that's so true that we have to understand what we're going to talk about, some of the darkest things that you can hear that goes on in families tonight, including incest and just dark things that 
I, I'm not going to describe them ahead of time, but we're going down a dark road. But what we want everybody to understand is there's deliverance for the son husband. There's deliverance for the alienated parent and there's deliverance for the alienator and the mother or father that's absconded with a child. If it's a mother taking a son or a father taking a, a daughter and, you know, causing those children to take on co-parent roles and raising other kids. There's deliverance for everybody involved if we'll just repent and seek the Lord. And I'm glad you brought that up, Chad, because that's what we're trying to get to is freedom for God's people to get out from under such a dark, oh man, it's so dark. I just don't know how to describe it as being one of the worst things that goes on in the church. And it's the least talked about activity because people are so uncomfortable talking about it. But as we present it tonight, and I've got video of another guy that's talking about it too, we're going to show. And we're just going to uncover all of this so that freedom could be had by everybody that wants freedom. That's the bottom line. This is really about getting freedom for the church, no matter what part of the equation you're involved with. So just getting started, we have a lot of slides here to present to you. The first thing we want to establish is that the son husband is established to usurp the father's authority. It's part of a greater overall emasculation and demotion process. And that happens with mothers that are being alienated too. They're being demoted under the children as well. They're being put in a place where they can't lead their children anymore. The other parent is completely taking them out of the process of parenting through either emasculation or diminishment, Chad. And then also the Jezebel enforces this to put the biblical mandate of Christ head of the man, man head of the woman, and parents head of the children on its head. That's the number one goal. And this is just one of the ways in which it's done. You know, when you're talking about like emasculation in the case of the man or the demotion of the parent, the alienated parent to a position of um, being under the child or the children. What are some ways that you've seen this occur, you know, in your ministry? Because you've talked to a lot of people that have been through this. With the groups that I'm involved in, you hear a lot of stories from both the men and the women's side, but mostly I do hear a common thread of, of fathers sharing the story about how it really seems like they've been completely usurped, completely replaced by somebody. There's always some head of the family now, whether it's another man in the life or they actually acknowledge that their own son took the, the man mantle in their family. And it's interesting because I work with a lot of people that aren't even Christian. So these people are recognizing it even outside of the scope of Christianity or, or believers in Christ that they know that a father should be respected and, and is the head of the home and is, is uh, desperately needed in the family for rearing children, for stability, to keep things calm or, or on the right track, you know, with things. Uh, fathers can do things and, and add a lot of things to the family dynamics that a mother does not and vice versa you know so uh, these roles are very important and single families that are single other than divorce they admit how hard it is it's extremely challenging especially if they have to work and pay the bills and they're left to relying on other people in school or whatever the situation is to to rear their children so when you have a situation in a divorce situation where a Jezebel or narc has actually stolen the children and is placing a child, a son, usually as we're going to discuss tonight is typically the, the mother is creating a new role for the son in the family, the oldest son. Didn't and giving you tell me that you heard from someone you're ministering to or some situation where the child actually like texted the father or, or spoke to the father and said, well, I'm the new head of the household. I'm the new man of the family now. And uh, you're, you're, you're done. You're toast. I'm, I'm looking after mom and the other kids. I sure did. I shared that with you and it was pretty shocking, you know? So it was, it was a situation where the um, the children were told lies about the father. They were they were put in a lot of great fear of their father through the uh, through the alienation process. It's like the, through the mother alienating the father, and so it was very evident. Surely this, the mother the mother is the one that told the son husband if that's what I'm going to call him that you are now the leader of this household. She told him that she literally told this boy that, and she made the boy believe that they were in great danger from the father. And so he felt very compelled to, to communicate that to the father, that he's going to do everything in his power to physically protect uh, his mother and sisters 
from this dangerous father. Well, you know, when when the proper person in the leadership role is really it's a, it's a mutiny of sorts and he loses his role according to scripture and if the person's a christian then not only is he demoted but god's word is demoted and therefore god is demoted and this is the god alienation aspect of it jezebel demotes god lower than the man by defying god's word about the the leadership hierarchy of the house and then if the man is a christian she's extracting him so as to keep the children from proper instruction uh, in the things of God for the children and for herself. And this is thereby God alienation. In fact, this was a very supposedly Christian home. So they knew better. You know, they knew God's word. They were very studied. And for the fact that uh, this mother just jumped ship and said, forget everything you know about the scripture. I'm changing all the rules. I'm changing everything. I'm going to use the government to protect all of us from a scary father even though there's no report or fact of any wrong. And that's part of the alienation of the other parent by making up stories and hearsay and lies about that parent, not only with the children, but with the flying monkeys and the general public as a whole, with the courts. It doesn't matter who they lie to. They have, they have no qualms about that. And that right there is breaking God's word. Thou shalt not bear false witness. So, the word of God's being broken on so many levels by a narcissist or a Jezebel doing this to the other parent, whether it's a man or a woman, and they are alienating themselves from God. They're not doing things God's way. They have put a wedge between themselves with God, and the, that God alienation is extending to the children now by causing them to fall in lockstep with their own sin, which is going to put a wedge between the children and God, too. It, it's a full court press by the enemy in the life of a family in this situation, and you know we keep bringing up that Jesus said that I came not to bring peace but a sword and two will be against three and three against two in a household and a man's foe shall be they of their own house and when he said that and we're reading that 20 30 years ago yeah divorce was was rampant already but it seems like it's just it's there's so much corruption in the family courts and and we talked about that before and I don't want to just sort of go down that road but I'm just saying that everything in society makes this situation right for the picking that Son husbands are being made uh, left and right, and we'll say daughter wives are being made too on the on the other side of the the coin. That's right. So, what God does Jezebel serve? So, if she's not serving the God of the Bible, then we've mentioned this before. She serves a pantheon of gods, whether whether it's Saturnalia or Ishtar or Semhain, which is Christmas, Easter, and uh, Halloween. Uh, or gods of science, psychology, medicine. She's going to turn to every device of man that's outside of the word to justify herself. And at the source of it, Jezebel is a Satanist, and she will worship all abominable demonic spirits, but she'll act like she's still a Christian, even though it's clear that she's a phony baloney and her life doesn't line up with Scripture. In the least, and neither does the clergy, Chad. That's right. So... I can't help but to think what it might have been like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, how the church is so different now, probably, than it was then. And these things we're saying would be so much more noticeable and so more detestable. The uh, pastors and clergy, as you said, they would not get involved and participate in such devilish activity that Jezebel performs in their midst they would probably get to the bottom of things. This, this is just sickening. The stories that I hear over and over again of those who are Christians who are beat up by the clergy, who are false accused, who are the clergy's taken one side, typically the female, and only getting the female side of the story, which is opposed to Scripture, and even conversing with these children to a point where the children believe that the other parent— and in this, this regard, we're talking about the father is actually doing the wrong things that mom says or, or is a bad person or a scary person. And we're, we're here. We're the church. And we're siding with mom. And we're going to protect you kids from this crazy dad. Right. So they're be, believing the narrative. And a lot of times they're not even checking up with the, the false parent. And we're not saying that these churches won't, I want to say, screw over. I know that's not appropriate. But they'll screw over our woman, too, if she's probably filled with the Holy Spirit and wanting to do right by God. They're going to attack whoever the Holy Spirit is in for sure, but it's happening a lot to men as well because the Jezebel spirit is ruling the brick-and-mortar church, the spirit of Ishtar, of Semiramis. We've well established that 
all these churches with all their um, idols and with their spires and steeples, which represent obelisks, which represent the male member of the sun god Ra, they are masons and they're serving a satanic agenda. And it's no wonder that they would turn everything on its head and define up as down and black as white and just terrorize people with untruth and with gaslighting. And they're doing the same thing. And so it stands to reason that the gaslighting parent, as they get before these gaslighting pastors or the gaslighting uh, family courts, that they're going to get these people to side with them and do this great evil. It's just the Jezebel spirit run amok through all of these layers of organization. We can't be surprised if they're exhibiting uh, Masonic architectural structures and doing the things that they're doing that are against the word of God. We can't be surprised when they turn on God's people. It, and I, I just recalled a story, uh, as you said that, about a female who she shared a similar story. Her husband was cheating on her. And the same church that turned against me and came in the courtroom and gave false testimony, and false witness against me with no fact, with all hearsay, the same people from this church turned on this woman and she was more than willing to forgive her husband, but he wanted to move back in the home and he wanted to continue this relationship with the woman he was cheating with. Wow. And the church actually wanted this woman to put up with a husband wanting to reconcile with her, but at the same time, not repenting at the same time, continuing a relationship with this other woman. Okay, how can the church do that? We act surprised, but should we be? Because the whole church is in spiritual adultery against God. It's no wonder they support and try to gaslight and really abuse the victim. Narcissists and Jezebels always attack the victim. She's the victim, and they're like, well, you just, you know, you ought to just forgive and can't believe you're still holding on to that. You know, stuff like that goes on where the victim is abused yet more by the organization. And you know, we have a quote from a female here that says, not in my case, my children in the church sided with dad. I believe the enemy blinds their eyes and helps people who are not in Christ to side with the Jezebel spirit. Absolutely. I totally agree. Because, you know, in ministry, we it's all anecdotal, but we talk to a lot of different people, and there's a lot of different people getting abused, for sure, in the church. And it's usually the person with the Holy Spirit. But getting back to the male-female, when the male is the Christian and the wo the woman is the defiant Jezebel, they go to the clergy, and the clergy goes against this scripture that says, and if they, that is the women, learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. And they are literally taught against that. You know, whatever I say as pastor overrides your husband. And God never intended for that. He never intended for the church to reach into families and uh, disrupt what the Christian father is doing. Now, there's differences, differences when there's cases of abuse and all that. I'm talking about when it's a decent-hearted Christian man, and they reach their grubby tentacles in there and disrupt what he is feeling led to do. And I've seen it time and time again. This is evil and wrong. And it's also part of the scheme to of God alienation. That's right. I know of a story of where a father was dealing with a situation where in his home he had uh, internet protection for his tablets and his child was overriding the settings on this software that was supposed to protect them from seeing pornography. And this child also stole a, uh, a lot of money. And this was a repeat offense. This continued to happen over and over. The father just got frustrated over and over again and said that if, if, if this happens, you know, again, that, uh, you know, we just got to take these tablets away from all the children because this child was unmasking the other tablets for the other siblings to see pornography, the younger mm. ones. Mm. And this, this child was in the neighborhood of uh, 12 at that time. And the other children were younger, as young as uh, seven or eight looking at pornography. And so the father is trying to control the situation and do the right things by God and feels extreme conviction to to handle this in the right manner and had no other option. He was using the best internet protection on the market, did his research, and so he determined that he's just going to have to physically remove the tablets from the situation. Well, as he's trying to take on this, this uh, decision he's made and felt that he was doing a, a godly thing, you know, his child tells him, that this child and his mother had already been 
having multiple discussions with a pastor at this church. And the father was very frustrated, and he was being told by the son that we've already tattletailed on you, you know, Dad. We've told him all about you, that you're a bad person, and you're just mean, and, and you know, all these bad things. And so the dad is really conflicted. He's like, oh, wow, what, what in the world? What have y'all been talking about? And the pastor says, you're wrong, and you shouldn't be taking our tablets from us and, uh, and, and treating us so horribly. Well, okay, so the dad's in a quandary here. He's like, well, I made my decision, but it sounds like the pastor's overrode my decision. So this dad calls the pastor, and the pastor act like he was on the same page with the dad. So the dad felt confident and said, okay, well, can we set up a meeting right away to straighten all this out with mom, son, and, and the dad? So they get together, and uh, after an hour consulting, the conclusion, it seemed like at first it was going well for the dad, but the conclusion was the dad wasn't spending enough time with uh, the children. <laughs> the dad was the bad guy. Uh, Yo, good old uh, bait and switch. Yeah, and a lot of money had been stolen repeatedly to put violent video games on these tablets that the dad didn't approve of. And so what happened was the pastor, so-called pastor in my opinion, he said, don't punish your, your son for the wrongdoings he's done repeatedly over and over again over the past you know year or longer. And don't make the son pay the money back either. It's just a crazy. He's basically inserting himself in parenting. He doesn't have all the information. And the information he does have has been completely perverted. He has no right to insert himself into that situation whatsoever. And then the most bizarre thing was that the pastor... Uh, said that don't take the tablets completely away from the children. Just limit their access to just a few hours a day. <laughs> As if they'll stop looking at the porn and having it a few yeah. hours a day. Yeah, that was his best solution, was just limit them to a few hours a day, nothing about protection from the porn. In fact, all that time during the meeting, it was interesting because the father saying, you know, there is no Internet protection. And the mother saying there is. And so the father finally said, this is crazy. You know, the mother's lying. There is no Internet protection. My children are looking at pornography right now as we speak, you know, even today. And the mother finally confesses being, you know, put in a corner by the father. And, and the mother finally confesses in front of the pastor. And from what I understand, the pastor had no reaction to this mother lying to him and to the son and to right. the husband. He's just part of it. He's part of the overall scheme. Yeah, man, this pastor's crazy. It really is crazy how they get inserted, but that's all part of the emasculation process, the diminishment process. And again, it cuts both ways. Mothers have been undercut too. We're talking about son husbands here tonight. You know, and transitioning from that, the son husband in that case got with the mother and they conspired to make sure that he would still have the freedom to do whatever the heck he wanted, to steal all the money he wanted, to charge their charge accounts or whatever. And the mother's just enabling it all because she, then probably the main reason was she wanted to assert herself over the father and diminish the father, get the clergy to help. But there's one thing that she will not allow with her son husband. The Jezebel herself cannot be overridden by the son when she's serious about something. She's really using him for her benefit and for her demons to pervert the family dynamic as much as possible. So deep down, she doesn't really love the son husband in a, in, a, in a wholesome way. It has nothing to do with that. She's really using him, and she's using him uh, as her emotional, you know, talk to person. She's treating him as an adult. She's talking to him about things. She may even be getting physical with him. There's all kinds of things going on that are uh, making that relationship into an aberration. But it's really mostly to help her take the wrongful authority she's not supposed to have. That's right, Doug. What great confusion that's being created here, handing over this baton of power from the father to the son. And then, you know, the son has got all this power, and of course a child is going to make a bad decision. So when that bad decision comes about, the Jezebel wants to control the son and, and try to usurp the son's decision. He ends up getting some of the treatment that the, uh, the the husband used to get with henpecking and just controlling and riding him too much. And then probably he revolts from time to time. I bet you it's not a very peaceful relationship in the end. 
Oh, it, it's got to be just plastered with confusion and, and strife and turmoil within that family dwelling, wherever they're, you know, residing. Uh, all the dynamics of the children, you know, watching this whole showdown happen between mom and son as they are confused, like, is this brother or is this dad? You know, the whole thing's just riddled with disgusting twists. So some people are just arriving and they're hearing son husband and it's confusing to them. I'm going to redefine it. The son husband is the son of the mother who has alienated the father and she's caused the son to take on the role of her husband. And she's crossed lines in that relationship with her own son to give him uh, responsibilities he shouldn't have to speak to him about things he doesn't need to know about to basically make him become a, a so-called quote adult way before his time. He's not able to handle it and things get out of control. And this next thing we want to talk about is son, husband with siblings will often be malevolent and bullying. And the reason for that is like the mother who takes the father's role or the father takes the mother's role. When you take a role that's not yours and God didn't create you for it, you're not going to be equipped to handle it. And we were talking earlier today that in the case of maybe a woman that's been widowed and there's an elder son or an elder daughter that has to take on more of a role than would have been otherwise, I bet you God helps that. And he makes it so it can be a peaceful transition and the elder child is is going to be enabled to do whatever he or she needs to do to fill in the gap for the dead parent. But when it comes to this situation, and a woman in this case revolts against her husband, against the word of God, he's not going to give peace to that situation. He's certainly not going to enable the son husband to uh, be mature enough to handle leading the family as if he were a grown man. So some things that can happen after the son husband has made, quote, the man of the family, as we, as you told us about earlier, is... When he's in a position which he should not have, he turns malevolent and bullying because he's not mature enough to handle the role. He'll often use yelling, threats of violence, and actually hitting to get his way. But the dad who was once there, who should have been the one administering discipline, there's no fear for him because he had his role of, of administering corporal punishment or spanking removed by society, removed by the church. You can no longer uh, spank or do anything physical to keep kids in line and then the father is completely disrespected. Society's played a big, big part in that. And then instead of the father who can, in a more benevolent way, administer corporal punishment, administer spanking without going off the rails, without being crazy. That's not to say there aren't dads that don't go crazy and off the rails. I'm not saying that. But a Christian father who's operating the Holy Spirit, who is obeying the word of God that says that uh, to... Um, administer the rod to the child uh, for his own well-being to save him from hell. And if he can't do that anymore, but now you've got this older son who's actually, because he's closer in age to those children, he's striking them, Chad, he's hitting them, he's yelling at them, he's putting fear upon them, and the only reason they're obeying him is because of this uh, this fear that that should not be coming from that older son. Absolutely, Doug. In a divorce situation, you've got these Jezebels, you know, they're not looking anywhere close to 50-50. They want 100%. So the, the son is in, in a real bad situation, you know, because they've been put in this situation. It's been handed to them and been forced upon them by the Jezebel, rather than what you were sharing earlier about how um, if there was a death in the family or some some bad situation that just happened to the family where one of the older siblings, the, the sister or brother, had to take a step up and become kind of the mom and dad to help the mom or dad who was remaining. You know, so the, the widow or, or widower, they're having to, to go work a job. And that's really hard. And, this, and that takes away time from being a parent at home with a single family. And then so one of the kids or maybe a couple of the kids will step up and help around the house. And, and I, I do believe what you were saying, if I understood you right, is that God would would still help that situation, that they would be blessed, that they'd be living in peace with one another. And not to say they might have turmoil and fighting, but at least everybody's on the same side with each other. You know, yeah, there's no there's no other parent that's been made into a villain. There's none of the other parent passed away. I mean, there's just not. 
all the underbelly of discontent and evil and false accusation that's just causing all the turmoil you referred to earlier. And then this child that's been given this role of son husband and, and control over the other siblings, if that is the case, oftentimes some son husbands are only children, but in other cases there are other children and then they're given this power over the other child. And if they have any malevolency in them at all, that is a willingness to do evil and they're drinking and smoking or doing drugs or smoking weed and looking at porn and all the things we will. And we're going to talk about this more on a later slide, but it stands to reason that he's just going to be a malevolent dictator with those other kids. And if they don't do what he says, or if he doesn't get his way, he's, he's going to become abusive because once again, he's in a position he's not equipped to be in and it doesn't, it doesn't work out too well. You know, one thing you said today was that when things like this happen, that children often project the, the behavior of the father figure onto God. And, and this is another part of God alienation. So say, for example, if the father is a bad man, the children often see God as a bad God. If the, if the, the real father is a bad guy and he's doing drugs, he's beating his wife, he's, he's not uh, looking after the family or taking care of them, and he's stealing money from the family and you know gambling. I mean, all these things that, that bad men can do. A lot of times what will happen is the children of a father like that are going to see God as a bad father. So if a Jezebel gaslights the children and paints a false narrative about their their dad too, and they believe it, they can also project this false narrative onto God. And then finally, if the behavior of the son husband is, is as bad as we just described, that can also be reflected onto God. And this is another type of God alienation. That's right, Doug. So... When I read scripture, I really try hard to put myself into the scripture, into the reading of what was maybe going through people's minds. Try to kind of reenact for myself what what could be going on. You know, what, 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 why was this this person did this? What what caused them to think that way? You know, when when Abraham agreed to to obey his wife and sleep with a maidservant, you know, to make a baby when God promised that Sarah would have the baby. I mean, what's going on here? So I'm thinking about putting myself in the shoes of these children, little boys, little girls, as young as three or four years old on up to maybe junior high, who have an older sibling that's become a fierce dictator in their life. You know, it was scary enough that the mother, the Jezebel, put great fear in these children's minds that their father is scary, that the father's dangerous, the father's going to harm them. And they have all this, this fear so much to the degree that they, they completely sh help the mother with her cause and shut out that father out of this fear. Secondly, they now have even greater fear because they got rid of a father who was probably a good father. It's hard enough to be a mom or dad these days, right? But the father was probably a fairly good father. Most of them are. And they've been... Well, most drunk. guys that are trying to stick to the Bible are. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There's a lot oh, of bad dads out there, I mean, obviously, but the one we're but, talking about Christian men right now. Yeah, we're, we're focusing on uh, a scenario of a Christian home, Christian man who has a Jezebel. Rebellious wife, right. The Christian man off. So these children are, are, are now under the dictatorship of the new father, the so-called father, the, the big brother, who they're kind of running head against this guy. They're, they're defiant to him, and, and so big brother's got to prove his point, and he's, he's not having much luck or success probably, I'm imagining. And so he's got to re retaliate with, with great force to a point where he's punching or bruising, getting, bruising throwing bricks. Uh, who knows? You know, I've heard of, you know, um, bricks being thrown at each sibling, you know, bricks in a house or outside a house, you know, just uh, just some crazy stories of, of, of the violence that escalates in the home when you have a, uh, a son who's who's trying to become the father over these these kids. Exactly. Well, I know Chad want to take a little darker turn. And I kind of want to bring up Semiramis and Nimrod and Tammuz. And this story is a legend. There's parts of it addressed in the Bible, like Nimrod spoken of in the Bible. There's uh, women that in Jeremiah that weep for Tammuz. And I want to give a little bit of background on them because, and, and this was another angle that I read today that I'd never heard it said this way that I want to reveal to everybody. 
Uh, I got this from True Riches. It says, Who is Semiramis? According to the historian Eusebius, Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod. In the Sumerian language, her name is Semur, Semur Amat. According to less trustworthy traditions, Semiramis was Noah's granddaughter and both the mother and wife of Nimrod. So how does she become mother and wife? So let's read this story. According to various legends, Semiramis became pregnant after engaging in an adulterous affair while married to Nimrod. Around this same time, Nimrod dies in a, a violent and untimely death. In an effort to retain power and to hide her misdeeds, Semiramis makes most a most audacious claim. She publicly declares that upon Nimrod's death, he had been resurrected as the god of the sun. As the sun god, Nimrod used his sun rays to miraculously inseminate Semiramis with a child. Okay, so it's saying she had an affair, she got impregnated, now she's got to make up a story about it or else she's going to be known as an adulterous whore. So at any rate, it says, This child was thus considered to be divinely conceived. The child's name was Tammuz, which she claimed was the reincarnated Nimrod. Thus, Semiramis was both Nimrod's wife and mother. So this reincarnated child known as Tammuz became, uh, the other legend I heard was that that baby ended up becoming her husband yet again. Now this is all legend. I have no way to prove it, but I've heard tales told of that. So after the scattering that occurs in the Tower of Babel, the story of the miraculous conception of the child disseminated throughout the world and led to the rise of various birth, death, rebirth cults that are littered throughout history these mystery religions of future generations adopted different names for Semiramis and her child, Tammuz. And you can see how that turned into, um, in Catholicism, as well as Eastern Orthodoxy, Mary and Jesus were just, the, their version of Mary and Jesus, which is anti-biblical, was just taken from the Semiramis, Tammuz uh, legends and mythology and applied to uh, Mary and Jesus. And that's how we get the idolatry that's in the church today. So how does this apply to us? So to what we're talking about, it's like this is the first recorded instance of a mother and her son being together as a, as a marriage. And believe it or not, this kind of thing goes on a lot these days, not only with step parents and children, which happens a lot. Also, the, the incest aspect of it, it's, it's very dark and it can start at a very young age. The Jezebel mother could be just like the other Satanists that draw vampiric sexual energy in the way all Satanists do from the, from the younger and more innocent children. And they believe they get more uh, power, Satanic power, if they, the younger they go. Also, Satan craves this type of abomination to God, both incest and pedophilia, which can create a, also create a mind fragmentation in the victim. So you hear about MK Ultra and mind control victims that were abused as little children uh, sexually, and that caused their minds to fragment and makes them more controllable, almost like Manchurian candidates. I know I'll use a lot of terms there that you might want to look up MK Ultra. Um, and uh, Manchurian candidates, but a lot of people have had their minds fragmented through early uh, sexual abuse and also physical abuse. Now, often these mothers, they don't ex uh, engage sexually per se with the son, but they can, uh, they can expose them to their own, the mothers can expose their own nakes, nakedness to the children constantly or through lack of clothing at all, walking around butt naked in their birthday suit or just wearing sexy negligees, see-through clothing and that sort of thing. And just overall not caring about what their children see them in or not in. And they cross boundaries in that way, but they'll also cross boundaries where they go into the bathroom while the child is showering. They bust in on him when he when he or she is naked or sitting on the toilet there's they're just constantly crossing of these uh, sexual boundaries which is really quite quite bad so now I want to play a video that's pretty long and I may stop it in the middle of it but I want you to see this guy talk about sexual abuse of sons by mothers and he's really gonna bear this out and it's it's quite a good uh, story so I'm gonna go ahead and present that now I'm going to talk about the subject of sexual abuse of sons by mothers. This is a taboo subject to talk about, and not surprising, considering mothers are considered to be sacred in our world, in our society, in our families, and their relationships with their children is also considered to be sacred most of the time. And what this means is that it's very hard to look at mothers as being imperfect 
And when we talk about sexual abuse by mothers, that's considered about as imperfect as it gets. It's also an extremely primal betrayal because really our mothers are our first examples of love. They're our first examples of what it means to have a relationship. It's our first example of what it means to be cared about, to be nurtured, to be treated with good boundaries, to be treated with respect. So to talk about the subject of mothers sexually abusing their children, it's the exact opposite of all these things. And it's extremely uncomfortable to talk about. I don't actually find this an easy video to make at all, but I wanted to make it because I think it's actually extremely common. And I think it actually could be really helpful for people to hear about this more because really what I've observed is not very many people do talk about it. And when they do try to talk about it, a lot of times people, oof, they don't want to hear it. They just want to push it away. So for starters, I want to note that when I talk about sexual abuse of sons by mothers, I think it can happen on a really broad spectrum. And on one end of the spectrum, we have the extreme end. And I think pretty much that would be considered like overt incest. I don't think I need to give too many examples of that. I don't think I'm going to give any examples at all. But, and I don't think that is actually all that common. At least in my experience and my knowledge, I don't know how common it is, but I don't think it's that common. Now, on the other end, we have what's considered to be the milder end of sexual abuse. And I think that's actually very common. I think society doesn't consider it common, or society denies that it's sexual abuse at all. Now, what do I mean when I talk about mild sexual abuse? Well, for starters, I actually don't really think it is mild at all. I think it, in itself, objectively, it is actually pretty extreme on an emotional level, the way it affects boys, the way it affects them as they grow up into men. But on the continuum, compared to some of the more extreme stuff, yeah, I think it could be considered more mild. But examples of this are mothers talking inappropriately about sexual matters with their sons, sexualizing their sons in different ways by talking about them, by talking about their body. Also, mothers behaving seductively toward their sons or in different ways, showing their bodies in different ways under the guise of, oh, just having an open, free body. But I think a lot of times it, they can do it in really sexual ways, in ways that on an emotional level, there's a lot of actual sexual energy going on. And it's starting from the mother, not coming from the son at all. I think also a lot of women use their sons as surrogate partners, surrogate husbands, surrogate boyfriends surrogate therapists and transmit a lot of sexual material or a lot of their unresolved sexual needs on sort of an energy level to their sons. And through this, they really violate their son's boundaries. They violate their sexual boundaries. They, they violate their, their innocence. They can violate their emotional selves. It, it can, and it can really, really mess up boys. That's why, although, yes, it's on the milder end of the spectrum, I think it actually can be really extreme and really affect them. Now, how do I come up with saying this is actually very common? Because that sounds like an arbitrary thing to say. So my reason for saying that it's actually very common is first, having been a therapist. Having sat with a lot of men who had a lot of sexual problems, and a lot that actually didn't even have a lot of sexual problems, but just listening them to them talk about their relationship with their moms when they were younger. Hearing what they had to say, and hearing some of the shocking things that they talked about. And a lot of times it happened as the result of the men tracing the history of their inappropriate sexual behavior. And going back to like, whoa, their moms really did violate them in all sorts of ways. And a lot of times these men had no idea of it. And a lot of times it was extremely painful to look at. A lot of them still held their mom in sort of an idealistic regard. And so to look at this stuff and to consider, oh, that their mothers actually did things that really harmed them was very, very painful. Now, this helps me explain why this is such a taboo to talk about, because there's so much pain behind looking at this. Who wants to think of our mothers as people who did horrible things to us, who really violated us and really screwed us up? But if we look at it objectively, and I think as a therapist, that's what I really tried to do, because I wasn't out to get moms. Instead, I was out to try to help my clients figure out 
why they were in such pain, why they were acting in ways that were so self-destructive or destructive to other people. Well, what I came up with by listening to so many people was, whew, this was actually a very common phenomenon. Now, a second way that I come up with the idea that this sexual abuse of sons by mothers is extremely common is by just looking at society and looking at how disturbed the sexuality is of so many men, if not most men. It's like, whoa, and where did men get this? Now we could say we live in a society that raises boys inappropriately with regard to sex, that tells them it's okay to violate women, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's a little bit simplistic because I think a lot of times when I've looked at it at a deeper level and listened to people going through what they went through, the kind of stuff that happens in society all the time, what I've heard is that it does come back to their primary, very basic relationships with the people that really taught them the meaning of what it meant to have boundaries and the meaning of what it meant to have relationships at all. And basically where they learned about sexuality in the first place, and a lot of that was by inappropriate relationships with their moms. I think a lot of men, when they were boys, really were treated very, very inappropriately by their moms. And this doesn't get talked about, again, because it's so painful, because it goes against so much of the grain of what we hold up as sacred in our world and in our families. So I think even within families, a lot of this can be denied. Now, another part of this is that I'm not saying that moms were conscious when they were doing that, that mothers were consciously sexually abusing their sons. I think a lot of times they didn't even realize what they were doing was sexually inappropriate at all. Or emotionally inappropriate in a sexual way. I think a lot of times what moms were doing, they were replicating what had happened to them in their histories. A lot of times in their own relationships with their own parents. A lot of times with their dads. And I think from what I've heard, certainly from a lot of women, is that their fathers were in many ways very, very sexually inappropriate. Sometimes their moms were too. And a lot of times other men in their lives were. So when they were very young, when they were children, when they were girls or even younger, when they were babies sometimes, they were treated as objects. They were treated as sexual objects and they were violated in all sorts of different ways. It could be emotional, it could be directly physical, it could be touch, it could be through no touch at all. But what happened is that they learned all sorts of inappropriate models for relationships and they were traumatized by this. And what happens with traumatized people who don't heal it, who don't acknowledge it and fix it, is that they dissociate from it. They split off. So they're emotionally out of touch with what happened. Often they're out of touch even with the memories of what happened, aside from the emotional content, just from the direct memory of what happened. And as the result of being split off, when they get in relationships with people over whom they wield a lot of power, they replicate the dynamics of their own abuse. And when you get a mom who's in a relationship with a child, that relationship is the greatest power differential of any relationship that we can have because mothers, parents in general, but I'm specifically talking about moms here, have more power over their children, especially over their babies, than anyone has over any other person. And it's very hard for people who have been traumatized, not at some level, to replicate what they've gone through. Now, I think a lot of moms, most moms, very, probably a very high, high percentage of moms, don't physically sexually abuse their sons. Now, I don't know this for a fact because really, who knows what happens to little baby boys behind closed doors when moms have total control, when the dads aren't home, when there's nobody watching, when no one sees what's going on, when the moms don't tell anybody. I have ideas that probably a lot more happens than we as a society recognize, but I still don't know how common it is. But on the milder levels of the spectrum, I think it's very hard for moms who have suffered any degree of sexual trauma in their own childhoods and haven't resolved it to not act it out with their children. This is part of the transgenerational transmission of trauma. What happened to the moms? They turn around and they do it to the people over whom they wield the most power. And a lot of times I think they acted out toward boys because it was done to them by boys. 
Also, a lot of times when moms have been violated by their dads, it's pretty normal to really hold some sort of anger toward male figures. And sometimes, even though they can really love their sons in a lot of ways, sometimes that anger can leak out toward their boys. Now, also, I think what happens a lot of times is moms feel very, very disappointed in their relationships with their male partners, with their husbands, with their boyfriends, with whoever their partner happens to be. Because a lot of men are really terrible toward women. They're really rejecting, they're really abusive, they're really violent, they're really inconsistent, they cheat, they, you know, they really, they don't treat the women well in a lot of different ways. And as a result, a lot of women, I think, are very, very unhappy. They're very lonely. They feel very isolated. And suddenly, here they have this baby, this baby boy, who desperately loves them, desperately needs that mom to love them back, and will do anything to gain this mother's love. And I think sometimes, or more than sometimes, moms really can take advantage of that. And they can see this, this perfect little boy as something to make them happy in all sorts of different ways. A lot of times I think it basically happens on an emotional level, but a lot of sexuality can get charged through that emotional level. It can run down the current of that emotional connection. And through that, it can really violate the little boys or even baby boys sexually. And it can really, really mess them up. So again, when the boys grow up, they have really distorted pictures of what healthy boundaries are with women. Mm. And I think this really does explain why so much sexual abuse does happen from men toward females. Because they've really learned a lot of really inappropriate stuff in their basic primary relationship with a woman. Now, the third way that I've come to really think of sexual abuse as a very common thing is that it happened to me. This mild stuff, pretty much all of this mild stuff, happened to me in my relationship with my own mom, who really had a lot of really bad sexual boundaries. And it really messed me up. And at the time, when I was a kid, I didn't really even know it. I really wasn't even aware of it. Part of it is because I needed, I needed to believe my mom was great and perfect and wonderful, like all little boys want to believe their mom is fantastic and wonderful. And the thing is, my mom was great in a lot of ways, and that's what made it so confusing. But that painful stuff, all the painful stuff that was really inappropriate, that was actually sexually violating of me in a lot of ways, I couldn't acknowledge it. It was just like it didn't go well. And if I, ha I had tried to acknowledge it, if I had tried to set boundaries, whew, it would have lost me a lot of intimacy in my relationship with my mom because I really think she would have rejected me. And what happened to me as I got older is I started looking at the patterns. I started looking at my childhood. I started reclaiming a lot of my split off feelings. And I started remembering how I felt and I started re-feeling what I went through as a kid, what I wasn't allowed to feel. And it was extremely painful. And what I started doing is I started talking about this. And that's when I started realizing what an incredible taboo it was. But also, I found that I became much more sensitive to listening to other men talk about their stories and also to listen to the dynamics that were going on between mothers and their sons, and also listening to the ways that moms talked about their sons. And I started realizing, ooh, these dynamics that I went through were not really unusual. They weren't just aberrant behavior by one mom. It's like, no, actually, this stuff is pretty common. and. I think a lot of the things also that mothers do that they can get away with are things that men could not get away with with children. And moms, a lot of the stuff can slip below the radar, part because society idealizes women in a way that it doesn't quite idealize men. It's a lot easier to see dads as imperfect and screwed up. But another big reason for this is that women in general are considered to be sexual objects. They're not really considered to be sexual subjects. Yeah, I mean, there are people who are more advanced who can really see women as sexual subjects, but in general, I think society a lot of times is pretty primitive and backward in viewing women as sexual objects. They view women as receiving sexuality, 
being passive in terms of sexuality, not really having sexual feelings, not really having sexual desires, not really having sexual thoughts so much, and certainly not being active forces in sexual relationships. They, they see men as being active. Men are sexual subjects. Men are sexually active. Men sexually do things. Women sexually receive things. And I think this translates into relationships with moms, where it's very hard to conceive of mothers and of women being sexual abusers because they're objects. And how can an object who is passive, who's there to receive sexuality, actually be abusive toward another person? It's, it's hard to contemplate, except when we look at the possibility, well, actually, maybe women are sexual subjects and women do have sexual feelings. And from what I've observed, and certainly listening to women and knowing tons of women and having been in a bunch of relationships, yeah, women definitely are very much sexual subjects, but I think it's important that we also consider that many of the ways that mothers sexually abuse their sons is different from how men sexually abuse people, men sexually abuse children, men sexually abuse women. Because a lot of times with mothers, a lot of the sexual abuse doesn't involve physical touch. And I, I came up with that as a statement once in a book that I wrote that most incest never involves physical touch. And I think that can be hard for people to grasp sometimes, but I think it's, it's like on a conceptual level, it's actually kind of simple that an acknowledgement that a lot of sexuality and sexual violation can happen without a hand ever being laid on another person. And if we can accept this, it's a lot easier to see how mothers can sexually abuse their sons. Now, I'd like to share two examples outside the family system showing how society has difficulty acknowledging that women... I think I'm going to draw it to a close now. We saw a lot. And there's a lot, Chad, there to unpack. But the three main things that I, I heard were, one, that intergenerational and that it's men abusing their daughters and... and, and sons sometimes and women abusing their children sometimes and that it's intergenerational and it's a generational curse and it happens to one and then they replicate it with their own children who replicate it with their children and it just goes on and on and certainly satan does that through familiar spirits he causes people that are involved in these things to be titillated by these uh, relationships that are taboo and forbidden by god's word that are abominable to god to god and his word and so that was something I've, I really gleaned from what he said. I also gleaned the aspect of it with, with the female that a lot of times, as I said before, there's no real touching involved, except there's a lot of uh, boundary crossing behaviors that go on. And the third thing I, want, I gleaned from it, and he said this about his own situation, is that this behavior really messes kids up for life. And it makes it very difficult for them to have uh, good relationships with anybody in their future. They're, they're in their, their minds, their psyches, if you will. I hate to get psychological sounding, but there's always that undercurrent current of that sexual relationship. The first one they had was actually with a parent. And that's what makes this hu son-husband thing so sick when these lines are crossed in any way. And I like the point that he made, Chad, that that it doesn't have to be through touch that a kid can be really messed up for his future without deliverance from Jesus Christ and by the blood of Jesus. They could be messed up for life. Yeah, so Doug, I have a lot of interesting thoughts through this video as well. Um, so Jesus said to even have the thought is just as bad as committing the sexual sin. Right. And, you know, this... I think that, you know, there is so much going on in the spirit realm, the, the spiritual side of things that we just don't realize. So our sin is um, uh, there are consequences to our sin, no matter that we follow through with the physical or or this, the mental spiritual side of it. And so um, one thing that's for sure is this guy, he didn't bring up anything um, biblical or spiritual for sure. And um, absolutely, there is no excuse for a man or a woman um, using touch or not using touch, um, uh, crossing lines with their children. 
this is deplorable, this is a sin, this is something that can be uh, asked forgiven of, but, uh, but Jesus, you know, speaks very harshly against um, uh, those who harm children, and this is definitely harm. This is bad. There, there can be no excuse for this. It doesn't matter that you were abused as a kid. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah, because you're going to bear the brunt of it. At this point, that's the God alienation aspect of it, that you're alienated from God now. And chances are you're going to go off and do the same thing, and you're going to have to bear the responsibility, you know, of what of your own choices. And, you know, that leads very well to this next slide where we say that it creates this son-husband thing, creates sexual deviancy in the son-husband. When these boundaries are crossed, whether there's touch or not, whether there's real incest or not, the son husband can begin to act out sexually both in and outside of the home through pornography and masturbation, um, through fornication, uh, homosexuality, bestiality, all the perversions of the Bible become can run the gamut, especially when they're introduced to pornography, because there are so many layers of porn where you may start on porn light, but you can end up with some dark stuff for people that I know that have gone down that road. Uh, because porn has become very dark. There is actually pornography that uh, mother, mother, child pornography, step parent pornography. There's all of that. And then it goes way worse into uh, bestiality and some of the darkest stuff like of um, eating, e eating excrement and drinking urine. All the things that Satanists do can be represented in pornography orgies, um, homosexual orgies, um, Gang bangs. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be so vulgar right now, but I'm just saying that that whole world can open up to a kid in two clicks without money. And then suddenly he's in that world. He's been hypersexualized uh, from his infancy if he was messed with and dawdled with as, an, as a toddler. And then and, and if he was fragmented as that man confessed that his mind had split and he had, he had quarantined off those uh, thoughts and memories of what had happened with his mother. And when that mind splits and you start going down roads, you, sometimes you can do things sexually you don't even have memory of. And you're almost like a Manchurian candidate in a way. And, and, uh, not only that, and then I'm gonna turn over the floor to you again, but all of these things, you can go down that road. And then you can also, if you have siblings, you become, you become the teacher to them to do the same thing. And suddenly you're teaching your brother or your sister to masturbate, to look at porn, to do all of these different perverted sexual things. And suddenly the whole family is perverted because the parents were so messed up, probably from their own history with their parents. Man, like we said, this is getting dark, brother. Um, I said it was. Son, yeah, the son husband. Um, if if the son husband is entrenched in pornography, and I got to tell you, friends, um, I'm under uh, great suspicion that the typical pastor out there in the neighborhood of ninety percent of pastors struggle with pornography. Mm. I hear stories of people who. Uh, work in the hotel industry, and when they have a, a pastor conference, they have a spike in porn uh, charges in the rooms. Mm -hmm. And um, and these pastors, you know, they're, they're condoning of pornography. They hide it. They don't. They play it down. They act like there's no healing or 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 there's no way to turn it off. It's just a sexual situation that men deal with. And now it's on the rise with women in upwards of 70 plus percent. Now it's growing rapidly. And so, uh, you know, porn, if if there's a son husband, I would imagine 90 percent, if not 100 percent of son husbands are addicted to porn. Yes. OK, that's my point. I went a long road to get to that point. But you're not getting is, help in these Masonic temples for sure. These churches with steeples on top are only like you like you say. If, if all those pastors are showing up at conventions and looking at porn, stands the reason they would because they're Masons. They worship. They've got a penis on top of their roof. That's right. It's all yeah, about sex. Awesome. It's it's a sex religion. Most of modern Christianity that's not biblical is a Baptist, whatever, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholics. It's a sex related erect penis religion. I know that's gross. I, I'm just telling it like it is, Chad. Yeah, I think Baptist and um, uh, Catholics, it's so funny how they hate each other, it seems like, but they're so common in that regard with the Tammuz, uh, all the all the images, uh, idolatry with uh, 
uh, Mother Mary and the baby, you know, the, we all have these images in our mind and we think that's Mother Mary and with the baby, but no, <laughs> it's not. And, it's not. Uh, it's a Vesca but, Pisces usually. The Mother Mary's in a Vesca Pisces, which represents the female part. It's so it's disgusting on every level. And you know, Chad, you know, people don't like to talk about this like the the guy said it's taboo. But this is the basis for modern ba Babylonian, I'm going to call it uh, Egyptian so-called Christianity. It's not real Christianity. It is sex magic. Even the architecture of the churches is conducting sex magic on you. You're walking into a building with an erect penis on top. It yeah. stands to reason that that's going to get into your spirit. They're conducting sigil magic on you to make you addicted to sex, make you addicted to pornography, make you addicted to perverted types of sexuality, incest with your family, Semiramis Tammuz. It is really gross. And you know what happens? I've seen a lot anecdotally is when you've got son husbands and children that are that have been sexually molested by their parents that makes them a target outside of the home because molesters and people that do that their demons or familiar spirits say oh that's one he's you're tagged already and so chances of someone that's been molested at home being molested outside the home i don't have any raw data for this but i bet you it's super high chad what's your view on that I, I I actually I, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, uh, that there's so much going on in the spirit realm that you know there's these these uh, spiritual handshakes and and uh, and triggers and and there's this communication going on uh, in the spirit realm where um, uh, you know the de the demons are saying, hey, right over here, buddy. I see you. I know what you do. And this guy, he's perfect, or this girl, she's perfect for this situation. Let's let's uh, let's create this a, a new situation. And uh, well, these uh, Satanists love to pass these kids around, and you you can see that with all of the uh, child stars that have turned into absolute perverts, and they're they 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 they're raised to be lily lily white and honey sweet, and then they turn out to be like Miley Cyrus or or Beyonce, or all of these uh, sex vixens like Katy Perry or Jessica Simpson, they all start off as putting off this Christian air and then they go down this road. But that whole time when they were children, if they were involved in masonry, they were getting molested, dude. Well, the Houston Chronicle, and I hate bringing up something off the cuff like this, but I, I know for a fact it exists, and you can Google it. The Houston Chronicle did a uh, expert... Ex, uh, 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 like almost a front pager, I guess. It was a pretty big deal. Our article about um, the Baptist Church having just about the same, if not you know, uh, similar uh, uh, situation as the Catholic Church with the priest and sexual misconduct. So right. the leadership, the leadership of the Baptist Church is just as severe and significant in abuse and sexual abuse as the Catholic Church. It's sickening and. Um, it stands I, I to reason. I mean, I think they're doing it so much more when they're Masons behind the scenes because these are Satanists that really believe they're getting sexual energy, the vampiric type energy from these children and the younger and the more innocent, the more power they get, demonically speaking. Well, being that um, I, I've ha I'm been involved with the Baptist Church for you know, 25 plus years, let's say. Um, I, I really feel like I'm telling the truth here that a lot, I've always heard a large percent of Baptist pastors are Masons or involved with some type oh. of occult with Masonic or they're involved with all the extensions of the Masons, which would be, uh, uh, the Lions Club or, uh, um, uh, what are some of the other ones? I, uh, they're not coming off the top of my head. Scottish Rite or those Scottish ones that Rite. drive around the um, at the parades and the little the little carts with wear the little hats. I can't remember what they're called, but yeah, but those are all the uh, preppers. You know, they're they're prepping those people, at, preparing to target one of them for the next one to bring into the Masons. You know, right. so uh, th those are the ones that are. But low, low, those are the low-level do-gooders that are thinking they're doing. They're in a fraternity that to help other people, and they haven't made all their secret packs yet and gone up, you know, to the thirty-third degree, where at that point, you know, the sky's the limit on all the darkness they've done. 
Right, but but I recall in in this particular same Baptist church where the pastor is telling uh, you know this uh, this father uh, to allow porn to exist in the children's home against the father and, and siding with the mother and saying yeah. you know basically saying to the father obey the mother yeah and but but he wouldn't admit to what you just said he would say you know the children are going to be good they made me a promise and you know they're not going to do it again and but he knows full well that kids will be kids are going to do what they want if you give them the opportunity and he literally just took over that family and but, uh, yeah louis says shriners i was talking about the shriners but I kind of want to shift gears, Chad, because we got a lot longer road to go on. Is that okay? Yeah, I was wanting to share with the about that church though that the the they do a lot of skits on the stage and they're hypersexualized. Right. You, you have uh, these females in in very tight clothing, yoga dancing, pants, sometimes provocatively. And you even have pastors wearing muscle shirts and tight pants, and they are buff and, and, and you know, yep. pectorals sticking out, you know, just all, you know, showing off. They're, they're uh, not being, I don't know if they're being sexually provocative, provocative. for doing it, but uh, if that's what their goal is, but they're definitely showing off their, their muscles, you know. And so it's just, the whole thing just seems sexually uh, wrong. You go into church and you see uh, people wearing what is that called? The spandex that shows every little ripple in the woman's, you know, curvatures and right. And, and they're sitting right next to you or across from you or or whatnot. And 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 these girls are wearing. They look like prostitutes in the church. I mean, this whole thing's being condoned in the church. Totally, and that's because it's a Jezebel church. It goes. It's a Jezebel spirited church. Yeah. And that, that's the bottom line. Like Jezebel came to do what? To seduce God's servants to fornication. That's the bottom line. And it's just so sad that the dark underbelly of this is that Jezebel spirited women and narcissistic men are seducing their own children to fornication and incest. And that's the dark underbelly of this. But shifting gears to the father, I want to talk about the fatherless child statistics. And, you know, I bet you this would apply for children who, who uh, don't have their mothers either, like a single parent. Um, I, you could probably almost call this children of single parent st stats. I can't be sure of that. But 63% of teen suicides, 70% of juveniles in state institutions, 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of children in chemical abuse centers, 80% of rapists, 85% of youths in prison, 90% of homeless and runaway children are children of single of single mothers and fatherless children. And uh, here's a couple more stats to show you. Um, we already read the 90% of, of um, runaway children. Down here, father absence has shown to lead to rates of depression, rates of divorce, rates to, of substance abuse, increased rates, uh, lower educational performance, lower life expectancy, lower average income, lower job security, lower levels of health. 40% of children in father absent homes have not seen their father at all for at least a year. And if this is happening because of parental slash God alienation, and this is being done to our children on purpose. It's not just the negative consequences of, of, of the chance for sexual abuse and incest, but there are real life things that are showing that are the fruit of that, that are the additional fruit of this uh, occurrence of parental alienation. Some of these are dead are fathers that just left. That's just as bad, even worse. But in the case of, Parental alienated Christian fathers or mothers where their children turn out um, insecure, unable to perform, unable to focus, showing um, signs of what the world calls ADHD and all of these other things are happening in their lives. Propensity to steal, propensity to hang out with the wrong people, propensity for fornication and sex outside of marriage and having children outside of marriage. All of those things happening at a greater rate. It just goes to show you that in the case of where parents are divorcing and alienation goes on, the children hardly stand a chance, Chad. Yeah, so I, I just want, again, to reiterate that this is a tough subject, a dark subject, okay? So if you are listening right now, um, you know, this is not about, uh, uh, you know, us trying to expose something you didn't know so that you know it. It's really um, 
something that, in my thoughts, even just looking at this, all these statistics, if you're a, a mother or a father that's concerned the fact that you've been alienated from your, your children and you're concerned for your children, um, you know, you, your children don't have to be this statistic. You can be on, uh, on, on, on the spiritual warfare path yes. and, and praying a hedge protection over them. And exposing uh, your children to the word. Yeah, yeah. If you have any contact with these children, you can be exposing them to uh, God's word and the truth, and, and maybe uh, they'll come out of this stupor that they're in of, of being uh, alienated from you. But but ultimately, uh, stay on a very prayerful path for them into their adulthood. Uh, hedge of protection for them, pleading the blood of Jesus over them, and uh, and and uh, I, I just. Uh, I just pray the best for you and your kids, you know, in these situations. And you could even break soul, unholy soul ties between them and their and their parent. Break that unholy soul tie. Like, let's say you're the alienated mother, and just to reverse it, to so that we don't feel like we're dogpiling on women. But let's say you're the alienated mother, and you have a father that's stolen the children, and you suspect there could be some kind of foulness going on. Just to say in the name of Jesus, I just bind up any demonic spirits of incest between my child and the parent and the other parent. I bind up every spirit of perversion and uncleanness. I loose an unquenchable hunger and thirst in my child to get away from that parent or to to be safe to to stay clear of those situations. I also ask, Father, you put your hedge of protection about the child. And as the parent that's right with you, Father God, I break the unholy soul tie that formed between my child and the other parent in Jesus' mighty name, uh, whereby no demons can continue to, to uh, cross back and forth. Also, I pray for the healing. If their minds have been, the, the child's mind has been fragmented, I pray for healing. I pray that they would tell some proper authority so this would come to the light and these things would be um, worked out in public. That, that which is done in the darkness, we brought onto the light. And uh, maybe maybe that prayer right there will lead to some of you getting your children back because this is the one thing that when it does get out in the open, these even these masons in courts, once this stuff becomes publicized, they have to act like they actually are against it, and uh, that's that could actually increase the chances of you getting your child back. So I would definitely pray when there's these son husband situations or or daughter uh, wife situations where lines are being crossed that. You would pray that the children would be awakened to what's going on and uh, reveal it to the proper people that could bring this out in the open and and be remedied that way. You know that might, that's all. To Chad's point, that's all you've got, which is the best thing you've got, is this spiritual warfare to ask God to bring these things out into the light. Now I want to talk about how a lot of this has been done on purpose, or I want to let Aaron Russo tell you about it when it comes to. Um, feminism and the spirit of feminism, which I believe is the Jezebel spirit, trying to divide families apart and create these situations, it was done on purpose. So I've played this video before, and Chad mentioned it when we were talking about this today, and he thought it would be good to show you again. So here it is. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he was well, we at the house one night, and uh, we, were talking, we were talking, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I'm pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before women's live. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's live, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. You know? Aaron, did you know that Gloria Steinem, in one of her own books, now admits the CIA funded Miss Magazine? No, I had no idea about that. No, I never heard that. 
that we're going to... CIA funded Ms. Magazine? Funded Ms. Magazine with the stated goal of taxing women and breaking up the family. No kidding. I never heard that. Well, Nick told me. I mean, I mean, I know it, but not because I know the CIA was involved in it. Well, she, Gloria Steinem was proud of it. Oh, the CIA wanted to help me help women. No and, kidding. And so they funded it. Yeah, and, and of course it's divide and conquer. Right, and, of and course. And what they do is they focus in, obviously, on real problems. Women were getting shafted in many ways, but the elite didn't wasn't planning to help them. They were planning to really shaft them and take men away from them. Look at what they did with black families. You only had about 10% of legitimacy 50 years ago. Uh, in black communities, and now it's over 90%. And look at welfare. You were going to give you some money, but you can't have a man in the house. Right. And, and so that was further to degrade the family, yeah. totally destroyed, uh, and, and, and now illegitimacy is over 50% in the general uh -huh. population. Right. Well, see, the whole thing is, is the, these people control the money, so they make all the rules, you understand? And, and they put whatever rules they want into effect. And the truth is, America has really become a socialist, communist country. And nobody, believe, everybody says it's a capitalist the country. It's not a capitalist the country. You know, how can it be capitalist when you have a All right, I know that was Alex Jones on there, and I'm just going to tell you, he's COINTELPRO. There's no doubt about it. Look that up, what that means. In my mind, he's definitely a fake. But that interview sticks with me because of Aaron Russo's sincerity and... It does seem like all of that was going on with feminism during the sexual revolution where everything went with sex and everything went with drugs. You know, Jeff and I talked the other day about the LSD explosion in the 60s and the drug explosion, the free sex. And a lot of children were exposed to that uh, during that time. And it's it's led to where we are now. And we have such a drug e epidemic. And most people don't realize that don't take drugs, but drugs are sex tools that lead to sexual deviancy and alcohol overindulgence in alcohol also does. And that's where a lot of this incest is happening through the use of drugs and pharmacia and people's um, inhibitions are let down and suddenly they're having sex with their children. And a lot of these um, mothers that have son husbands are abusers of, of alcohol at the least they're drinking two bottles of Chardonnay a night, or they're doing some kind of um, drugs and then they end up having sex with their children. That's all part of the satanic ritual with these children. And, you know, just transitioning to this slide chat, I jumped ahead to scapegoat siblings. A lot of times these son husbands can be the golden child. And then there can be the other kids can to varying degrees can become the scapegoats. And they could be falsely accused, assign false blame. All the chores and the duties can be given to the scapegoats while the son husband is living the dream. He's living the life of life of luxury. It's got all the the PS2 games or I don't know, PS4. I don't know. I don't play video games. But he's got all the video games he wants. He's staying up all night playing Halo with his buddies over the internet and smoking weed and just bossing the other kids around. And the other kids are doing all the chores that, by the way, the former husband used to do that uh, the, the mother, the Jezebel mother would make the husband do after he worked all all day. He'd come home to find a, 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 a kitchen full of dishes to wash that she didn't do. I mean, I've heard stories like that. But uh, what do you have to say about these poor scapegoat kids, these other siblings? Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, a few different uh, testimonies of things and, and heard of uh, – uh, in, in instances of, of the, uh, the son father um, having almost a, a godlike attitude, a godlike figure in, in the setting. And the Jezebel allows this to exist because she's proud of this new godfather she's created and invented with her own power and her own demise and mm -hmm. how she's uh, usurped her, her husband with this bait and switch. Mm. And so the, uh, the, the children who are under the King's new, the new King's, uh, reign are living in great fear. They are, uh, in living in confusion. They may be regretting this whole situation, wishing, you know, their dad would come back and right. save them from this despair. Right. And, and the dad's trying all he can to be in their lives or to save them from the despair, but he, he just has no control because the government has clamped him, has handcuffed him, has thrown him in jail for false accusations, thrown him in jail for getting three. This guy I talked to the other night, $325 is all he was behind on child support. One month child support. 
uh, or half a half a month's worth of, of, of uh, child support. And they threw him in jail. And it wasn't like they threw him in jail for months. It was days, but they threw Still. this boy in jail. And, and so he's desperately trying to be in his, his children's lives. And uh, debtor, debtor prisons are against the Constitution. I mean, the family <laughs> court is just overriding even that aspect of it. I don't believe in the Constitution anymore. I've seen no. it broken too much. No, I agreed. I agreed. It's a, it's a facade. It's a totally. fake thing. It's just a dream. So basically, um, you know, I, I think uh, going back to, I think your question is, though, um, these kids are are living under a dictatorship under the the uh, 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 the new the new father in the home the the son and uh, and he is like a king you know he's running the roost and like you said he he's getting gifts he's getting to stay up as late as he wants do drugs get tattoos probably I've heard of that getting tattoos mm. at like age of of 16, 17, 18 age range, you know? This is ridiculous that a Jezebel would allow their children to be tattooed right. under, under her control. This is sick. But, it's, I mean, but it stands sick. to reason. It's another thing that's abominable to God, that, that Jezebel would see to it that he's allowed to do all of those things. She's not going to stand in his way, and she probably has a tattoo herself. Yeah. And so, uh, but but again, we're, we're, the question is how how are things looking for those children under this dictatorship? So living like a king, doing whatever he wants. But again, someone is a scapegoat, mm. or some, or all the children are becoming scapegoats. They're the ones cleaning, working, doing all the chores that the that the son should be partaking in. But um, you know, they become like uh, little slaves. And you know what this this godship, as you call it, that's given to him has done nothing but ruin him for regular life because other people in society aren't going to take take that from him. He's he's not going to be able to get a job where he can do whatever the heck he wants. At some point, if he doesn't repent, which we're going to talk about two slides from now, and and start to make things right and start to learn how to take responsibility for himself, he's only been set up for huge loss. So this next slide is the son, husband's childhood and his innocence of himself. It's been stolen because he hasn't been allowed to be corrected by his own father. And he's been given a total control. It takes on this mantle of son, husband, and that leads to him having responsibility at the level of an adult. And he can't handle that. And then he loses his innocency, especially if he's charged with looking after the other children. And especially if he turns into some, uh, megalomaniac when he's looking after them he's he's no longer innocent anymore like you said he's a brutal dictator and he's going to suffer the consequences of his sins he's embraced it even though he might not have been involved in the earlier manipulation but the more and more he received the temptation of his um jezebel mother and took on that mantle of his own volition the more and more he's going to uh, suffer the consequences in the long run Absolutely. So uh, what a shame this whole situation is. It's a shame. It's a sham that's been put on this uh, this son by the Jezebel. Um, this is absolute. It's sin. It's child abuse. This is absolute child abuse from Jezebel put onto the son. Totally. Totally. Which leads us to our final slide, Chad. The, this son-husband... First of all, the Jezebel needs to repent. Guess what? If you've touched your children, you can repent and God will forgive you. I truly believe that. This sounds like the worst, most egregious sin, but you can receive forgiveness. So anybody watching that hung in there this long, you might feel lambasted at this point, but and ashamed and that and 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 good. You should feel shame. That's the first step to repentance. You can repent and you should repent and make it right with God and God will forgive you. And Go to God and deal with him about the fact that you were probably molested as a child and deal with that and forgive those people that did it to you. And once you receive God's forgiveness for what you've done, forgive yourself and allow God to bring you into right standing with him. That's what this is all about. And if you're a kid that was a son husband, you've got to repent. You've got to repent to your dad uh, if you disrespected him and you took on that mantle because you enjoyed the power of it. And you enjoyed the fact that your mother respected you more than him and you could disrespect him and you seemingly thought you got away with it. 
There is no getting away with it. It's going to catch up with you and you need to repent for that with your dad and also with the father that you broke God's word and disobeyed his word about respecting and honoring your parents. That's one of the Ten Commandments to honor your father and mother. And if you honor your mother over your father, you've you've turned over the the order of things when you have a Christian dad where God made Christ head of the family, head of the father, father head of the mother, and the parents head of the children. And if if you've overturned that, you've got to repent to both God and your earthly dad and be restored to both. Now, your earthly dad, if he's not walking in a Christian way, he may not forgive you, but that doesn't matter. He may not like say with his own mouth that he that he forgives you. It doesn't matter as long as you do your part to confess and forsake your sin if you've wronged somebody to tell them so and do your best to make up for it. Now, finally, if you've crossed sexual boundaries with your mom, or if your mom, if you lived a child of being titillated by your mother sexually, whether she touched you or not, you've got to get that out of you. You've got to break soul ties with your mom. Same with little girls of fathers that were molested. You've got to break soul ties with the offended parent. You've got to renounce whatever lust you felt toward her, whatever incestuous feelings you had. If there was incest, you need to renounce that and you need to command all the associated demons of perverted sex and incestuous lust to leave you in the mighty name of Jesus and break soul ties or at least the unholy ones. And I want to pray with anybody that's willing to go through this prayer. If you want to pray this prayer with me now, just go ahead and um, follow after me. So, Father God, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for what went on with my mother and myself. Or if you're a woman, I'm sorry for what went on with my father and myself. I speak death to this behavior in me. I don't want to experience any more titillation due to perverted, abominable, and forbidden sex acts. I reject and renounce whatever my mother or father and I did if I participated. And I will never do anything like that again. I will never touch anyone sexually outside of marriage. But especially anyone in my own family. Including my parents. And my children. I reject and renounce this behavior. Father God, even as you reject and renounce it. And call it an abomination. I'm also sorry for any other perverted sex acts I may have done, including looking at pornography, masturbating to it, fornicating with other people outside of marriage, committing adultery, crossing boundaries with other people who are married. I repent for crossing boundaries for anyone in my family. I repent for receiving this Semiramis Tammuz spirit. I repent for being titillated by um, incest or mother-son sex or father-son sex or um, step-parent sex with children. I repent for being involved in any kind of satanic ritual abuse. I repent in being involved in any kind of sex trafficking. And inasmuch as these things happened to me, where I was ritually abused, I forgive the people that did it to me. Doesn't mean you have to be friends. You doesn't mean you have to seek them out. Doesn't have to mean you have to talk to them. You just forgive them. That means you don't try to take... Um, vengeance on them. You let God handle it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay. You let him handle it. I forgive anyone that harmed me in any way. And I seek your forgiveness for harming anyone myself. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. I also break soul ties that may have formed 
with anyone I may have had incest with, who may have molested me, or with anyone that I, any child that I molested myself. I'm not saying I've done that. I'm just saying if you've done it, you pray against it. I repent for that. I break soul ties with all of these people. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up any demonic spirits that could have uh, attached themselves to my life or the life of anyone I participated in these things with because of these abominations we did. And I command them to leave me right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I lose complete freedom from incest, from perverted lust, from being a son husband or a daughter wife. I lose complete freedom from that. I lose complete freedom from continuing the cycle and doing that to other people in my own life, other to my own children. In the mighty name of Jesus, I break the power of this son, husband, daughter, wife abomination that's in so many families today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And Father, I embrace your word. I ask that you receive me into your kingdom as you've forgiven me by the blood of Jesus, which covers my sins and brings me back into good standing with you. I will not partake in these sins again, and I choose to serve you and your word and to live my life for you, henceforth and forever. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and I come against any false tongues in me right now in Jesus' mighty name, but I loose in the name of Jesus that I would be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit so that I can walk out this walk and fight the good fight of faith and cast demons out of myself and other people. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Wow, Chad. Dark road we went on tonight. Yeah, so I can't help but to be so thankful for this show. And, you know, other people might have shows that talk about these things to some degree or a lot even further than we did but and and i think we could have maybe gone a lot more into detail but everyone gets the gist of what we're trying to accomplish here but my point is is that those other shows most of them if if not all of them are not offering solutions and the solution was just heard that prayer was awesome Praise thank you Lord. doug and and i'm telling you that um, I've had so many, I've, I've, I've butted head with so many people at the Baptist church and other churches, uh, very involved with other denomination churches. And my biggest frustration with these churches is their uh, denial that pornography is such a stronghold, and such an issue, and their denial that they can be set free. And I'm telling you what, anyone listening right now, I, I, I'm telling you, you can be set free. These pastors... Some of them are really good friends of mine. They'll call me in a dark moment and say, Chad, I, I, you know, again, you know, I, 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 I got a beautiful wife, but why do I go and look at pornography? You know, and, and, and these are pastors of big churches. And, and it's just sad because they do not understand spiritual warfare. Now, these are people that I've had conversations with before learning spiritual warfare myself. I just knew that. Uh, through spiritual warfare, it could be stopped, but I didn't know how to walk them in that prayer. Uh, and and, uh, and so uh, now I feel confident in what I'm saying, that they can be set free. And uh, if they struggle with it a short time, it won't last long. It's like casting a demon that returns. If that pornography returns in your life, it, it can be casted again. You can get this thing, this stronghold, finished for good. Absolutely. And if it keeps coming back, you just keep fighting. And so it's... The, the war is made up of many battles, and it just depends on whatever comes your way, whatever imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. That's what you've got to cast down, these, these imaginations that the enemy brings your way. And a lot of times, it, it has to do with getting to the bottom of it. Like, 
you know, I've said this before about the first time you do a sin. If you just go back and recognize that that was the first time you really hurt God with this thing, repent for that first time, and you can get some major deliverance out of that. And you can also get deliverance out of the fact that there are a lot of things in your life to that guy's point that we were watching. He was a therapist, dude. He was off in psychology. We know that. But he said some truths in there that I thought were worth showing. And one was that his mind had been fragmented by all this. He had a lot of things squirreled away and dark parts of his mind that he, he couldn't access. And you need to pray that your mind would be made whole and that you would um, be able to access these things and deal with them. And just like we did in this prayer, go back and maybe some things happen to you in your childhood uh, that you just need to acknowledge, uh, re even even repent and, and break generational curses. That should have been prayed for. You know, if this is something that's gone on and on in your family, just say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just renounce this uh behavior of incest and sexual perversion in our family and adultery and fornication perversion and bestiality i renounce it and the buck stops here i break this generational curse from over me and my children from both sides of the family related to sexual perversities and i just command every demonic spirit related to these familiar spirit related to these um curses to leave me right now in jesus name and just go at it methodically you know break the soul ties break the generational curses and god will deliver you and he is delivering you and sometimes it's like peeling an onion it's one layer at a time so don't despair if things come back your way again just say okay that's another sign i still have stuff to deal with and go back and deal with it in with spiritual warfare and get cleansed by that blood of jesus and let him help you and i'm going to say this chad like i really believe a lot of people are not in proper marriages right now or they got into marriages that never worked out because because of this matter, because they were involved in incestuous relationships or, 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 or son husbands or their daughter wives or they were molested by their um, step parents and they were never healed and they couldn't ever get with a decent uh, partner. They kept being drawn back to the same type of person who's in the same cycle as as they are and nothing could ever work out because of no deliverance. Well, just as this guy's sharing, he thinks it's very common um, with men and women, really, as I think is what he was saying. Yes. He was, he was saying that it was started with the the, the father uh, doing something to the, the, the daughter, and then the daughter grows up and does something, even if not touching, with the sons. And I remember growing up hearing these boys talk about their moms or so-and-so's mom. And how she scantily dresses and hits on us and, and flaunts herself. And everybody's like, I want to go to your house. Right. They they, you know? they even have a term for that now, MILF. Mother, I'd like yeah. to F. I mean, sorry to say that word, but I mean, that's how rampant all this stuff is. And like I said before, they're just in doing a search on um, incest today. There came up selections in, in my thing for pornography for mother, son, and step parents. All of those things just popped up, just searching on the word incest. So there are people with literally, quote, fetishes for this garbage because of the fact that this happened to them when they were children and they can't even help it. And they probably hate themselves for it, especially those that are Christians now and they want to be cleaned up. They want to be right, but they don't know what to do. They don't know how to pray deliverance. They don't know how to repent for their part. And they don't know how to break the soul ties uh, with the offending parent that did that to them. They don't know how to cast the demons out and break the generational curses. And they're just stuck with this never ending cycle of feeling like a pervert themselves. There's yeah, no deliverance. Think, and God wants to help those people, I believe. Definitely. Yeah, I think we're getting closer and closer to another Sodom and Gomorrah um, social society where the government is condoning this behavior, too. I'm hearing stories of uh, women wanting to marry their son or women wanting to marry their daughter, uh, having, having you know, it's actually out in the open. right. Like they're advertising how wonderful it is that me and my son are getting married or I mean, like uh, it, it, it could be the same sex or a different sex. But they're just saying that a parent is marrying their child. It's actually 
uh, I'm not sure that they're that they're awarded some type of uh, const, uh, some kind of marriage certificate, but it's out in the open. People know about it. Secondly, uh, you know, people want to marry their dog, kind of thing, or uh, or whatnot. But um, the the whole thing is disgusting. People are openly saying things in the psychology world, especially how they're condoning uh, pedophilia. Right. And and these people aren't being thrown in jail. That was the next step of all this. So like, like once you cross the line to any abominable sexual practice, like homosexuals marrying, and I know I could get flagged for having said that, but it's only going to be a slippery slope into, um, Oh, I saw a woman marry a tree in England on TV last year or on a, on a, in the news last year. I mean, it's just crazy what people are, what people are doing sexually and how, like you say, it's as it were in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the people wanted to rape those, um, angels even. Yes. It's so dark. It's so dark, but Chad makes a, made a good point. The whole purpose of tonight's show is not just to lambast mothers or, or fathers, or, or it's to bring to light what's being done in the dark so that we can be healed. We need to be healed. Jezebel mothers, if, if they can repent, they need to be healed. Narcissistic fathers, if they can repent, God will heal them. But more importantly, if, if, if you for some reason are a son, husband, or a, we'll call it a daughter wife that's listening and you're, you're young still, you're like 18, 19, 20, and you're just starting out in your adulthood, you better get deliverance now if you ever want to have a healthy relationship because i'm telling you this sort of thing without deliverance will follow you the rest of your life this is a something that will scar you and make you unable to have a healthy relationship for your whole life and that that is the this the super level of darkness as relates to this is that it messes with the victim for life and to that guy's earlier point, it can make you into, into the abuser yourself if you don't get free. And it's going to have you so messed up in life that like, you're going to think that there's no boundaries with, with regard to sex. You can have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want. If your own mother or your own father is having sex with you, what, what, is, what is worse than that? Everything is going to be open game for you. And I'm just saying that if you want to be someone that gets clean and can be married to another Christian that's clean, you've got to get deliverance. You've got to pray the prayer that we had there and, and, and seek God even more and get cleaned up and be made right. And, um, I know I'm speaking vigorously about this, but I mean, I I know that what I'm saying now is true. I know it's true. Oh yeah. In addition, I'm thinking about, um, life decisions that this this person you're talking to doug um that you're gonna make bad decisions and it's bad enough if you're not being led by the holy spirit and you're just wandering around but if you uh are not being led by the holy spirit but you are also screwed up in the head and you've been demonized to the hilt because of all this abuse on you and all the abuse you've inflicted on others and keep opening more and more doors for more demonic activity, you are going to keep making worse and worse decisions in your life, including if you get married, you might marry absolute the wrong person. And marriage is a very big decision. I think, uh, Doug, you did a whole video on marriage in that topic and even encouraging virgins to marry virgins and all that stuff. So basically, um, you know, now is the time, not later. Don't think that you have control over this. I know young adults saying, I know I got demons. I can fight it. I, I'll wrestle with a demon. I can control a demon. I can handle this. That is so foolish. Do not believe your own lies that you can you can fight a demon or beat a demon without the power of of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ to, to uh, save you and cast these demons from you. Exactly. But you know what another thing is, is that let's say you're a son husband and you were raised by your single mom and you have no idea how to be a man. You've been, a lot of these young men are growing up really effeminized. They even sound like girls. They don't have masculine voices. 
And they don't know how to behave as men because they were trained by women to be the aberration of a man that the women uh, are, have taught them. And I don't even think that a perfectly good Christian woman can teach a man how to be a man any more than I think a perfectly good Christian man can teach a, a woman how to be a woman. I think there's got to be that influence of the other parent. Now, I know that if, like I said, if there's a situation where someone's widowed or or if a mother has a husband that cheated on her and went and left and went off with another man, I totally think God will stand the gap. He's father to the fatherless and husband to the widow. Yes, all of that. But in, in this case where the mother's a Jezebel, she's going to teach that young man to be the opposite of everything that's true and good. And he's going to have to relearn how to, um, how to be a man. Like, here's something I took that I was going to skip over, but we kind of segued into it and this is going on and on, but I don't care. I think it's important. This guy made a list of things he would tell to single moms. He said, these are things you um, shouldn't do. He said, speaking negatively about their father, the boy grows up doubting himself. They think that there's something wrong with them because he's going to project on himself that men are bad. Saying negative things about men, this ma- this makes little boys afraid of embracing their own masculinity, their own male identity. And that leads to effeminate, effeminate boys that can't man up, as it were. Teaching their sons to disrespect their father's authority. We talked about that. Boys growing up to disrespect other fathers have no respect for all other men in society. And you see that with a lot of these simp guys that just can't take when a, when a man acts like a man for teaching their sons to disrespect male authority and male authority figures. This is why many boys who come from single parent homes have a hard time adjusting to the real world. That's what I was trying to say. Like they get out into the working world and they're just not other men aren't going to put up with that garbage. They're just not They're They're just going to just bu- slap them away. Not physically. They're just going to move on. They're going to get fired and the guy's not going to care. He's not going to care. Um, you wanted to say something. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm agreeing with you. I was amen and with you on that one because uh, I, I recall someone I know very well who has lived his life going job to job, and um, in in it, this guy thought he was the stuff, and uh, he he just can't hold on jobs. And now he's really not that old. I, I think he's uh, let's say he's 52. But he can't get a job now, and he claims that no one wants to hire someone at his age. I think no one wants to hire someone at his age, and they see his long rap sheet of not being able to hold a job. He can't hold a job because people figure out this guy has – he's screwed up. He's spoiled rotten. He can't yeah. – he probably doesn't get any real work done. He probably pawns it off on other people and takes the credit. He became a narc. Yeah, right, let's keep he going. This, this dude is the absolute narcissist. Yeah. And that's what this creates. It creates narcissism in these son husbands because they are, are lifted up. You know, I've heard of um, mothers or fathers, but the mother might tell that son husband, you know, I have two other kids, but you are by far my favorite. And they don't say it in front of the other kids. They just say it in private to that kid. You're my favorite. You're my favorite. Do you know... That'll make that kid feel good, but you're producing a narc right there because that is not right. And that's not right. And, you know, that's kind of what happened to Joseph. He was narcissistic until he got broken being in Potiphar's house and in, in, and in the uh, jail. God, God brought him down a few pegs after he got that coat of many colors. You know, it's, it's, a, it's abuse to over favor a child. And this type of favoritism that gives them what they want gives them, it's almost like getting... Halloween candy to to worship Satan essentially. You give them what they want and you make them satanic and that's what this does to children. It's like giving them a candy that's going to rot their teeth out and that's what um giving too much favor to this son husband or daughter wife does. It creates a little narc Jezebel. So I want to read through these really quick. There's so many and we might not read them all but uh, projecting anger at the father onto the son. These emotionally abusive blows knock boys down for the count emotionally before they even get up to become men. This is great stuff. Not allowing their father to see them. Boys need that relationship with their father to gain a sense of themselves and to understand their masculinity and male identity. There, There is no substitute for a kid's real father. Number six, not allowing their father to see them. Boys need that relationship with their father to gain a sense of themselves. Oh, 
I, I, skip, I need to skip to seven. Seven, bringing in substitutes for a father. This is really bad. Oftentimes he, oftentimes he winds up just as overwhelmed and frustrated as a single mother because at because there's no understanding of the family's history or the previous history of the child. So the mother's dating a bunch of men and bringing them into the house. You know, this was another psychologist, but remember Chad, Dr. Laura Schlesinger would say, you as a mother should not date again until the last child has graduated high school. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And um, uh, the roller coaster that you put or these females put, especially if it's, if it's a, a son husband, you know, uh, you're the son husband. Now I'm dating someone. Now you're not. And now you're the son husband again. I'm dating someone new. Now you're not. You know, the games that these Jezebels play with their children or their son husband is is just a roller coaster of confusion and, and, and torment. I'll tell you something, though. If that man sticks around, it will not be long before she usurps his manhood and puts the son husband over him. Yeah. In the beginning, it won't be that way. But the longer it goes on, she is by default going to emasculate that man. It can't be helped. So, you know, I there's a bunch more. I'm going to click to the next screen. And if you are watching this later on, you can screenshot this this screen or you can um, go to the web page. The title is Knowledge of Self. And I, I can't remember the, the actual name of the website I got this on, but this was on the front page at Knowledge of Self. And this guy had put up all these um, different points that he would tell to single mothers about how to um, raise boys. Now, one thing I do want to say Actually, I want to read this one. I can't, I can't help it. Number 13, establishing a codependent relationship. They use their sons to get their emotional and other needs met. It literally sucks the life out of these boys, preventing them from growing up to become healthy, functional men who can have a relationship with women his own age. That's what I was talking about, Chad, and, and what can destroy a son husband. He, he, he is just taken. His mother has made him into a eunuch for anyone else. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all out of selfishness from the Jezebel. It's all about her supply, her need, her, her desires, her, you know, it's, it's like she's, she's just sucking the life out of her son. You know, what's funny is I've seen Christian women that, that love God have a super hard time letting go when the son does remarry or grows up and leaves that leaves the, the nest as it were. They just have a hard time. And, you know, I can understand that the son has meant a lot to them and they, they birthed that son. It's meant a lot. But the scriptures are really clear that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And I think that just on a final note that women who are married have to keep the relationship with their husbands first in order that when the child children do leave, they don't miss a beat. They don't have to reestablish a relationship because the children became more important to them as parents than each other. That was something the transformed wife spoke to. And I'm going to give you the final word on that, that subject. What do you think about that? Yeah. So, um, I'm just, I'm just thinking how screwed up this whole thing is. And, uh, as I'm seeing just even other topics that this guy's written, I, I encourage everybody to go back through and read this very closely. Um, he's got some good topics Man, in here. That they're awesome. It's like blow my mind. You know, it's, it's like, I, I know people in my life. I've talked to other people and I can't wait to point this video out to a lot of people. I think this is going to help almost everybody I'm talking to. I mean, if they can get past the fact that this whole time they didn't realize that demons were real and exist, you know? <laughs> right. You know, there's a couple more I want to read now that you mentioned it. Trying to turn their sons into perfect people. Boys who grow up to become men who are afraid of taking risks, men who are always playing it safe, men who are nothing more than cowards. I remember I had a mentor, which I shouldn't have done. It was against the word to have a, a woman in leadership over me. She was my parents' age and she was in my life for quite some time. And man, she shut me down to risk. And I just remember that, that it was, she was quite controlling in that way. And I wasn't my own man. And I became a simp and a cuck through that process. And it really, it really stifled my growth a lot. 
it humbled me. God used it to humble me in the, in the long run, but it's just so many things that got, that were minor got criticized to the point where if I didn't do these minor things that didn't really matter in a perfect way, it, it spoke so negatively about me that I was constantly paying attention to little things too much instead of to the bigger picture. So here's number 19, not encouraging them or supporting them in their quest to become independent men. Without that void to maintain that codependent relationship with them, they'll wither away and die pathetic, lonely women. Or worse, they fear their sons will find out the truth regarding the relationship between her and his father. So they're trying to hold on to the boy because they don't want to become that these old maids without anybody to love them. And that and often they'll stay in the way of the boy marrying a woman and, like I said, make him a eunuch. 20. Not encouraging boys to embrace their masculinity. By emasculating him and destroying his masculinity and male identity, she hopes to get back at that man who she thinks did her wrong. That is another big uh, subject of with Jezebel spirited women is that they will take out what past men have done to them onto the present man in their life. And uh, that's no fun. I always said that was one thing I never wanted to be a part of again is to be subject to the punishment of what another man did and be micromanaged because of another man's uh, failures, even even times where men actually did do something wrong. 21, not encouraging boys to embrace their sexuality. Now, I want to say uh, that's this guy's probably not a Christian. The caveat to that is embrace their God-given sexuality with a, by getting married. 22, misleading boys about male-female relationships. The single mother may want a man who is their friend after her failed relationships with men, but younger women who are functional and want a good relationship do not want their men to be their best friend. That's a good point that uh, male-female relationships, it's different than friendships. 23, telling boys that all women are whores. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. The goal of this yeah. shaming language is to make the boy take the boy back away from the possible healthy relationship with the woman outside of her, continuing to maintain that codependent relationship. I mean, these are husband, son husbands like that go on into the woman's old age, it sounds like. 24, sabotaging his relationships with women. I saw that a lot in my life. Single mothers hate their sons having girlfriends because they fear that as he gets closer to this woman, he'll start establishing healthy boundaries that sever the emotional hose. They've hooked up to them. That's soul tie. You know, uh, Doug, I have a close friend that is hitting these last ones you, you, uh, you read off so well, and I've told them, I said, you know, uh, I got to be careful of what I say here because I love him. He's a close friend. And just, I just think that, you know, his mother loves him. Uh, she just had a bad, you know, divorce. And, and she basically, I think that she uh, kind of got him into thinking that, you know, women are whores or, you know, don't get in a relationship because divorce will come, you know, and uh, uh, he became feminized. He's, he's very effeminate. Uh, it, it's sad. And another point earlier, cause you went through these pretty quick was, um, the fact that, uh, uh, I think that a lot of women, they're, they're, they have a lot of set expectations before they get married. And, and as they're getting married, you know, everything's got to be perfect for the wedding. It's all about showing off themselves with the, with the dress and the, and the, the whole, uh, the whole dream of marriage. And then they marry their man because they're going to change their man. They're going to make their man a better man. And their goal is to make him a better man, a different man. And the in, but like, in their own image, not in the image of what he's supposed to be, biblically speaking. Exactly. Right. And so they failed miserably. And if they're a Jezebel, which that's a pretty Jezebelic you know, mindset, I think, but if they're a Jezebel and they do kick the man out of the house with false allegations and usurp his, his fatherhood and replace it with a, a son husband or whatever the situation is, but basically kick the, kick, kick the Christian father out. Uh, but they got a son husband in there. They're trying to now try to do it all over again with the son husband. Right. Yes, they're going to twist him up into knots, and he's not going to feel like he can do anything right. And that's when he's going to disengage and, and play video games. You know, I've seen that, anecdotally speaking, as a pattern in these boys. They just want to check out into another world where they can win <laughs> and, uh, you know, win the levels and level up and succeed. 
and uh, get away from the the chirping and the constant hassling and haggling of their Jezebel mothers. And uh, it it serves to simp cuck them in a way, but but even worse, it serves to prevent them from picking up skills and abilities. They're not out fixing a car with their dad and learning how an engine works. They're not, you know, learning how to play a musical instrument. They're not doing anything worthwhile. And yes, there are a few careers that are based around video games and programming them. And there are even professional video game players, but I bet you that's like 200 people total on the whole earth, you know, that play professional video games and make money at it. So this is not a money making proposition or it doesn't teach them how to do anything worthwhile. And usually all these video games have for first person shooters, witchcraft based, violent, um, you know, I've seen some game where Grand Theft Auto, where they go and steal cars and run people over and do all kinds of crazy crap. So it's like teaching them to be um, antisocial within the this virtual world. And then they come out and they're useless to society. But they ran into that world, that that virtual world, because the mother forced them to go there. They're trying to get away from the chirping and the control. Right. And their social skills... Uh... Uh, have declined or, re, or or regressed because uh, they're spending all their waking hours in this virtual world, video game world, whatever, and uh, there's no reality. They're they're disconnecting from reality every every day. They do it to a point where, um, you know, they can get pretty messed up in the head. I mean, they're 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 thinking of the world, their worldview, their biblical worldview their view of God, everything starts to get really warped with these video games. Uh, these video games are just as doctrinating with their messages as watching movies. It may be more so because they're actively participating in, in their, it, it literally, I, I don't play these games, but I've seen games lately that look like they've inserted themselves into movies. They're getting that realistic. The processing power of these gaming consoles are massive they have big GPUs and CPUs and lots of RAM, and they're literally running entire worlds where these people are, are in these worlds as if they're literally living there. I mean, it's not quite the virtual reality that, that Jeff was talking about uh, on the show the other night, but man, the leaps and bounds have been made, and these children are trapped in these virtual worlds where they're learning how to practice witchcraft, how to become violent. There's a lot of games that are sex based. Now they're getting their pornography through a lot of these games. Um, it's, it's a nasty, dark satanic world where they're trapped. A lot of these young boys and, and they're, and they're going off to college. A lot of them are able to get into colleges where they're just being even more, um, cucked and simped by this liberal left wing socialist agenda that goes on in almost all of these schools. And then we have a whole generation of men, of, of young men that you can't call men really because they've been raised by single mothers and uh, not every single mother is in that situation because they want to be, let's make that clear. But uh, the ones where it happened, where there was a Jezebel mother that abused the father and cut him out of the life of the child. And they end up with a son that acts more, like a, a false woman, uh, uh, you know, someone that's like a, a nebulous gendered person. And that's how you end up with all of these multi-gender situations where people don't even know who they are anymore. Right. Yep. It's, and so uh, it, it, it's just sad. And I think that it's increasing with the girls too, that they're, they're finding games that the girls want to, uh, to, 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 become part of this virtual society and virtual world. And you hear that, you know, people are virtual dating other people with virtual bodies that might emulate themselves a little bit even. So they're dating in, in with people all over the world that are not real relationships, but they're having conversations. They feel like they're actually there. They may even be doing LSD like your other video Jeff was. You know, there might be tripping out with drugs and in the virtual world. And so they're, and they're having they're, spiritual sex. Oh, yeah. And, and they're sinking their lives into these virtual worlds that are better than reality, than the real world, because the real world's hard. It's full of work. 
It's full of disappointment. It's full of trying to please people and disappointing people and letting people down and, and breaking, just screwing up, you know, constantly. No one's happy about you anymore. And life get the more life gets worse for these type of people, the more they're going to keep returning to the virtual world and doing whatever it takes to stay in the virtual mm. world as much as possible rather than being in the real world. Because in the virtual world, you have control over what you present. So if you want to present yourself as this great person, you just type it in. And, and I'm sure they, they can talk over Skype and Zoom, but you can still mask who you are through the virtual world. Right. And catfish people and put up pictures of yourself that are way better, that aren't you, that are way better looking models and whatnot. Right. I mean, it's really, really dark. Well, Chad, we've been on for two hours and 16 minutes, and I called ourselves loquacious today, and you weren't <laughs> sure what that meant, but I think you get it now. <laughs> yes. We are loquacious, and we're sorry, dear listener, we went on so long, but we hope it was content that touched your heart, and more importantly, if you got to pray that prayer, got you deliverance, no matter what part of this scheme you may have been a part of, and I'm, and I'm not implying that anyone watching is a part of this, but whether or not you were a son husband or a daughter wife, or if you were uh, the person that, that did did the wrong, did the evil as the parent, or whether it happened to you as a child and you did, and you just manifest it yourself as an adult. I am just encouraging everyone to get forgiveness from God and get deliverance, go back and pray that prayer. And if you need to contact us, Chad and I want to pray with you. And if you need to contact us for prayer, you can do so at withoutspot at gmail.com. And it may, you know, we, 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 a lot of people think we can pray right then at that moment. And we normally have a queue of people, but we will get to you as soon as we can in the line. We're not going to jump the shark for one person. We're going to keep, keep the line going and we will get to you. And Chad and I will pray for you together. Uh, if, but I encourage you first to go pray that prayer. See the soul tie, um, video on my channel. It's the number one watched video on my channel, the soul tie breaking video. And that video is about breaking soul ties with in, uh, relationships that are um, romantic, but you can use the same prayer to break soul ties with anyone. And uh, go to the generational uh, curse uh, breaking um, video, watch that, do that, pray the prayer in this one. And uh, once you've done all that, then call us. And if you feel like you still need extra support, we're glad to be with you, be there for you. Uh, then we also have. Uh, free music that you can download at the Reverb Nation link below. We have a blog spot without spot or blemish .blogspot .com. You can go there. Everything we do is free of charge, even when we pray with you over the phone. But if you want to support this ministry, you can do so at the PayPal link below. Um, right now, for me, this is all I do. And God has been providing through your gifts. And um, he's put it on people's heart to give when I've needed it. And I don't have any extra money, but I'm... I'm not losing any weight either, so I just give God all the praise and glory. And I'm very grateful and thankful to all the people that have given in the past and those who will give in the future as well. So, Chad, do you have anything you want to conclude with before we let all these nice people go? Yeah. Uh, thanks again, Doug, for having me on again. And uh, uh, I just hope people are uplifted and blessed by this video and know that there's hope to, uh, to be delivered of these situations, whichever role you played in this situation if, or someone you know. And, um, and also, uh, if any of you uh, uh, feel like you, you, you want to give to this ministry, I, I'm going to say this because I don't receive a dime and I don't you know, want, want money from this. It's, uh, it's going to the ministry here. And so some of you might feel embarrassed because you don't have a lot, but I'm telling you five, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, you know, what a, what a lot is to one person is, is different to another. So uh, uh, out, of, out of, you know, a blessing and, and a giving heart, you need to give to ministries that bless you and you learn from them and that change your life. And I'm telling you, um, things like this video is, is, is life changing for me. And so just acknowledge that and ask God what you can give uh, to this ministry and other ministries that bless you. Well, Chad, I didn't ask him to say that, and that kind of embarrassed me a little, but I mean, I don't disagree with him that I don't like to act, sound like we're begging, but if if I give to other ministries that bless me because 
and it's not a lot. I can't give a lot. A lot of times it's just 10 bucks, but I've done that three or four times in the last week or two, especially to ministries that I pull down videos from. I feel like they did a lot of work to make that happen and to tell people the truth and they're deserving of it. So I'm not just saying that to, to get you to give to this ministry, but if there are other ministries that are blessing you, you should consider, uh, you know, giving them a small, a small gift. You know, it's not just about this ministry, but and I really do appreciate Chad saying that, but it, I am a little embarrassed by it, just to be honest. I had, a, I had a feeling you might get embarrassed, so that's why I didn't ask you if I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said no, obviously, but you know, he does make a good point that you know God loves a cheerful giver. And I know the reason why saying these things from Scripture is that so many of these uh, prosperity gospel ministries, they say all of this just to fleece the sheep and to, to keep the people in lies. And that's why we're really cognizant of that and careful not to sound like we're begging like they do because they're begging to hurt you because they're all mostly masons and they're liars and um it's funny that decent ministries get punished because of what they've done to fleece the sheep and decent ministries are super careful not to try to appear to be like them chad you know don't you agree with that like a lot of good ministries get hurt because of their behavior and i think Satan and them, they know that. They know that they're making fools out of everybody, flying their corporate jets around and their Bentleys and their Rolls Royces and everything that they're doing. They know what they're up to and they know that hurts decent ministries that are just trying to continue to put uh, out more content to help people and to pray with people. Absolutely. And um, I think that's a warning sign if you're always hearing about give me money, donate this, and God's going to bless you 10 times fold and all this other stuff. You know, it's just, it's just not right. I've never heard Doug say that. And, and Doug's, I think he's been very, uh, uh, quiet for the most part, very humble when he does bring it up, you know? So, uh, uh, but, but just from almost an outside looking in, um, I, I just, I, I've, I've more been conscious of all the ministries that I've, I've I've been blessed by, you know, and, and I give what I can. And sometimes I remember I was blessed by something and I go and give again, even though I hadn't revisited it, you know. So um, uh, especially if you're not, you know, already kind of giving to a local, ch you know, uh, church group or something, um, you know, th this is an opportunity for you to give. Right. Well, I appreciate and also regret that you said anything, but it's a good conversation to have. And it's not just for this ministry, but other smaller ministries that are just putting out the truth and even getting, I mean, I never monetized and never would, but they're gay. They've been demonetized. They've been scurried away from YouTube. A lot of them, and they're on smaller channels like bit shoot and they have like one quarter of the viewers or less than that. 10% of the viewers. I put one bit video on bit shoot that I guarantee if it was on my YouTube channel would have well over a thousand views by now has less than 150. And I think that's the point they want to quarantine or push people off uh, that are telling the truth into smaller and smaller portions of the internet. And, and those ministries that are doing their best to keep you informed with, with, things about the truth um you know try to bless them back if they blessed you i guess is the whole point so yeah. well chad god bless you right back and i pray a special blessing on you for speaking out tonight and that god would be with you and all that you set your hand to do i pray a special blessing for everybody that watched and and i will close in a prayer father god i just praise you and thank you for blessing all who watched tonight in that or or today or whatever time of day when they watch that they would see all the things that have occurred in their life uh, for what they are and be able to repent for what they need to repent for and to forgive what they need to forgive for and to cast out uh, the demons out of their life that need casting out so that they all can be part of the bride that you're coming back for after the tribulation that is going to be without spot or wrinkle and holy without blemish, Father God. And that, that's what Jesus deserves, the bride of Christ, to be made holy. And I'm asking you, Father, to use this episode tonight to help others to walk in and holiness from henceforth and forever. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Chad, thanks again. We'll see you, we'll see you next time. Yes, sir. All right, there goes Chad, and we'll see all of you that are watching next time. Thanks to Melissa, Miss Minsanity. I saw Louie in here. Probably lost a lot of people so far because we went on so long, but Salty Dog, we thank all you guys. Chucky, Yaws Burnt Butterfly. All of you guys that were here tonight, we thank you, and we'll see you on the next broadcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry.